Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kyle Croft, Programs Director at Visual Aids. Thanks for joining us tonight for this virtual artist talk um, for Enduring Care on the occasion of Day With an Art 2021. Visual Aids is the only contemporary arts organization fully committed to HIV and AIDS awareness through producing and presenting visual art projects. We assist artists living with HIV, preserve the legacies of those we have lost, and celebrate the artistic contributions of the AIDS movement. Day Without Art was Visual Aids' first pu public project conceived in 1989 as a day of action and mourning at museums in response to the AIDS crisis. Every year since then, Visual Aids has coordinated and publicized events on December 1st for Day Without Art. So this past Wednesday on the 1st, we premiered seven new videos as part of Enduring Care. And we wanna give a tremendous thanks to all of our artists, Catherine Shares, Cristobal Guerra, Danny Kilbride, Abdul Ali A. Mohammed and Uriah Busay, Beta Perez, Steve Taylor, and Jay Triangular in the Women's Video Support Project. Uh, Enduring Care as a project grew out of our intention at Visual Aids to recenter people with HIV in conversations about the virus, which often focus on PrEP and prevention as a method of quote unquote ending the epidemic. Life-saving antiretroviral medications brought fundamental changes to HIV care in 1996, but there's still no cure or vaccine for HIV. The virus can be controlled to the point of being undetectable and untransmittable, but living with HIV also entails adherence to a regimen of daily medication and regular doctor's visits, self-advocacy in the face of bureaucracy, and dealing with stigma and misinformation. Enduring care addresses these multiple realities acknowledging the perseverance of care workers and people with HIV, while also suggesting how medicine and healthcare can be painful, difficult, and harmful. It's important to note that those living with HIV, in particular long-term survivors, are now living through two pandemics simultaneously. While the seven videos of Enduring Care don't focus on COVID specifically, their themes resonate across both pandemics. In response to systems that seek to limit our imagination around our individual and collective power, enduring care emphasizes our interconnectedness and obligations to one another. So it's been really exciting to see over the past few days, enduring care has screened worldwide at over 120 art institutions, universities, and AIDS organizations, um, including events in 16 countries as far as Taiwan, Colombia, and Turkey and screenings in 25 states in the US. We're especially grateful to the team of translators who have made these videos available in Spanish, French, Mandarin, Japanese, Polish, and Turkish, truly extending the reach of the project. Um, which also reminds me that we do have Spanish interpretation available for tonight's event. So if you'd like to listen to the conversation in Spanish, um, there is a little interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and you can select the Spanish channel there. Uh, during the conversation, we'll paste in some links to the resource guide that accompanies the videos um, that provides more information about the artists and the ideas um, discussed. And we wanna give a big thanks to Ted Kerr and the What Would an HIV Doula Do Collective for helping us develop the guide and to Aaron Fowler for designing it. Um, and as Alex said, the videos are also available to watch online. You can see them all right now at visualaids.org slash enduring care, in addition to the MOCA uh, website screenings happening over the next month. Um, we want to give a few thank yous. Day Without Art's success has always come from the support of so many friends, community members, and art institutions. MOCA in particular has been a steadfast partner for many years. Um, so big thank you to Alex Sloan and Brian Dang for hosting us tonight. And I'd like to now invite our panelists onto the screen and I'll read short bios for each of them. So everyone feel free to turn your cameras on and join me. Right. Hello. Jay Triangular is an independent curator, experimental filmmaker and multimedia poet. Um, her work consistently addresses themes such as community identity, self-empowerment, care practices, and promoting communication and solidarity. In 2019, we at Visual Aids worked with Jay as our international 
curate, curator in residence. Um, and she produced the web series, The Whole World is Watching, which has been exhibited internationally in Taipei, Tokyo, Kyoto, Tlaxcala, Mexico City, Lima, and Colombia. Danny Kilbride is a community filmmaker based in Liverpool, UK. He's the founding director at Thinking Film, a not-for-profit organization that exists to provide marginalized communities with a voice and tell stories that challenge the way people see the world. Abdul Ali Mohammed is a Philadelphia-born writer, organizer, and co-founder of the Black and Brown Workers Co-op. In their work, they often trouble ideas of medical surveillance, bodily autonomy, and Blackness. Uriah Bousset is a non-binary archival visual artist and educator from Cobbs Creek, Philly. Their practice spans printmaking, performance, and video, and offers dialogue with their personal archive, death, living spaces, and memory. Bousset received their BFA from Cutstown University and is a current artist in residency at 40th Street AIR program in Philadelphia. And finally, last but not least, we're thrilled to have Marguerite Van Cook here to moderate the conversation. Marguerite is a visual aids artist member and a filmmaker with many accolades, among them the collaborative graphic memoir, Seven Miles a Second, created with James Romberger and David Wanarovich. Um, she also appears in Steve Taylor's video for Enduring Care, I Am a Long-Term AIDS Survivor, and has previously um, collaborated with Jay on the web series, The Whole World is Watching. We're going to open up the program uh, to Q&As from the audience at the end, so please feel free to share questions in the Q&A box at any point, um, and we'll loop back to them later on. And with that, I will turn it over to Marguerite and to our artists. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, so as ever, with, with um, anything to do with visual aids, I'm delighted and honored to be a part of this. And I feel rather joyful. However, I have to temper that joy because we're going to talk about something very serious. So as much as I love my community, um, I, I can't minimize you know, what's being said in these films. And um, some hope coming, some problems. Uh, as ever, you know, that's the that's the path that we're going to tread. And I would love to kick off by um, asking you as a group, um, what's the most important takeaway that you intended for your audience? But also, what did you learn when you were making these these films? So who would like to who would like to start? That was I would like to start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Mocha Le, for having us. Thank you, Visual Aids, and thank you, Margaret. Uh, I, I love this question because actually yesterday in, in our presentation in Tainan, uh, some uh, people in the audience asked what is the main message in, in this film. And for us, it was really important to talk about HIV criminalization, especially here in Taiwan. And there is a law called Article 21 that is a HIV non-disclosure law that if uh, people living with HIV don't disclose to their partners, they can be ended in jail almost 12 years. So for us, it was really important to talk about what is happening here in Taiwan, but it's also replicated in many places and in United States, HIV criminalization. Thank you. Did you learn anything? Did anything surprise you when you were doing making this movie? Yes, yes. For me, it actually was like in my ignorance. I didn't know that um, the women living with HIV, when the baby is born, the baby need to start to take the medication in 48 hours. So for me, it was, it was something that I learned. And we discuss a lot about maternity and and that's something that I feel I, I learned and 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 was really tender to to talk about maternity with with them because for them their their childs are are their hope yeah yeah I mean and we're you know it's our bodies right and that's the that's the domain that we're talking about I had a quick question that um I wanted to ask Ali, what's medical surveillance? Could you explain that to, to our audience? Use that term medical surveillance and it was sort of uh, interesting. 
Yeah, hi, Marguerite. Hi. Um, you know, when I think about medical surveillance, I think about the ways that nonprofits have to, uh, to turn over information about people's HIV uh, medical history um, by law, right? In the United States, uh, you're required to share um, information with, um, for example, in Philadelphia with the local health center. Um, and if for some reason you refuse or discontinue medication, um, there are groups of people who are disease intervention specialists who come out in, in vans um, to track you down, right? To literally figure out where you are um, so that they can have a conversation with you about medical adherence. Um, and so that's one way that we're surveilled. The other way is, for example, on apps um, a few years ago, um, there was um, a report about how Grindr um, turns over medical information to, um, to advertisers, including people's HIV status as they select um, on the app. And so that's another form of surveillance or tracking people living with HIV. Um, and, you know, it, it many ways that we attract and, 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 um, and surveilled medically, um, but those are a few ways that I talk about in some of the writing that I do. Yeah, I mean, I was really interested to hear, um, I think it was um, Ina Akala, am I saying her name right? She was talking about uh, the fact that you guys have been creating language around, um, you know, issues of, um, let me see if I've got the quote here. Um, language around white supremacy, colonialism, and how it extracts from the disease of black and brown bodies. And I thought that was so interesting. Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. no, thank you, Marguerite. That's um, Inas Akila, who is um, with myself, one of the co-founders of the Black and Brown Workers Co-op. And um, what we kind of discovered or, dis you know, not discovered, but what we saw as problematic in nonprofits, is specifically in HIV nonprofits, is kind of this hierarchy where you have, for example, in Philadelphia, a city that's mostly Black and Brown, right, over 48% of the city's population is, is, is black and brown. But you have at the top of these organizations, specifically HIV orgs, white leadership um, in the frontline staff kind of reflects the community served, but not in leadership positions. Um, and that was really one of the reasons why the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative exists is to disrupt this whiteness that, that um, you know, is 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 um, the culture in the workplace um, of of many HIV orgs, um, and the people served are mostly black and brown. Yeah. So try to. Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask Uriah just to give yeah. a little bit of time. Is do you think that um, you know one of the things I also took away from your film was the idea that you were creating. I think somebody said we didn't have a roadmap or we didn't have an infrastructure going into to the project of you know disruption. Um, mm -hmm. And do you think now that that's some sort of model that you could replicate that you could share with other people of you know how to work on, on these kind of institutional? I mean that really shocked me. I have to say, thinking about yeah. that um, I think, not I think, profits are so hierarch high hierarchical. Yeah, I think. Um, what I've learned greatly is how this film with Abdul Ali that I've been so honored to make with and collaborate with and now be a friend to, uh, the shared experiences are amongst black and brown queer folks um, and how you throw yourself, like living is how you end up finding these structures for yourself or how to build this infrastructure for yourself and how to tackle these systems with each other and though we have different experiences um i remember interviewing louis and uh we like shared a moment of like yeah what kind of just like threw myself into this thing and like we did this thing and you know now i I remember um, him saying like, now I know what the tactics would be, you know, we, we would do this and we would do this. And uh, coming from personal experience as a disabled person, um, as a sick person too, like it's so many steps that people don't see behind the scenes of how we try to get our, like our basic needs met, our human rights met, 
um, and how we're often ignored. So uh, it, it was very beautiful to figure out that roadmap and to also figure out that roadmap within the film. <laughs> I think it was like- I, it so, I just said, I thought it was so interesting that you were talking about language and developing language because obviously in Catherine Cheer's film, Voices at the Gate, she's talking about um, how they needed, just for the inclusion of women uh, in the AIDS project, in, in, in the AIDS def, uh, definition, that they had to rewrite and formulate that language, you know, otherwise women weren't recognized as having AIDS and weren't even allowed that medication because of that. But there's a real, I mean, I, I'm just gonna go to Danny now because really, Danny, that was so happy for me. I just loved everything about everything that happened there. I was, I was, you know, to use a very English expression, I was gobsmacked that um, what happened that was able to happen that the police and the city and every, because that was unthinkable to me that people would come together around something like that. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to tell the story. I think I, um, I think I first heard about the Mersey model of harm reduction in probably about 2014. Um, and I was delivering my first project that centered um, the voices of people living with HIV locally. Um, I was working with Sahir House, who are Merseyside's HIV charity. Um, and in preparation for that project, I went on HIV awareness and stigma reduction training. And I think, I think the trainer kind of mentioned the Mersey model of harm reduction in a break during the training and kind of my ears pricked up and I was like, oh, this is quite interesting. I've, I've never heard this before. And really naively as a filmmaker, I just didn't realize that it was a film to begin with. So for a couple of years, it just was something I would like tell friends like casually. Um, I think Liverpool, um, with it being like a, a port city, um, has quite a, a, a strong history around public health and stuff like that. So um, the first chief medical officer in the UK was, was um, founded in Liverpool and there's kind of a, a pub named after him in Liverpool called Dr Duncan's. So it, it became like just a bit of an anecdote that I would share, you know, I found myself in that pub with friends and kind of go, oh, did you know that this thing existed? Um, and then, yeah, kind of was like, oh, maybe, maybe there's a maybe there's a film here. Um, and I think my, my challenge really going into the project was how do you distill that into, you know, its very essence and kind of communicate that with audiences. And I think what I wanted audiences to, what what to happen when it was screened for audiences was really to just introduce them to a story they might not have heard of do you know what i mean um and i almost wanted audiences to to be left with questions too um questions around like the amazing model of harm reduction so that they can go and find out more but also questions around what was taking place in their own communities during those periods i think you know as someone who grew up without any sort of education around hiv aids everything I learned as a young person probably was through film and media, which meant it was really U uh, US heavy. So I kind of had an understanding from a US perspective. Um, anything I understood from like a UK perspective was like nationwide and just had completely no idea what was going on in my own local community. So for me, it was just an opportunity to kind of tell that story, introduce audiences to that story and kind of, I think, give it the platform it deserved. Like you said, I think it is, um, Ultimately, it's a, it's a positive story. And I think, you know, I started to refer to it as like, the you know, the four P's, like police, press, politicians and priests. And I think in in the narratives around HIV AIDS that I'd heard in the past, they were they were obstacles. They were kind of like the villains of the piece. And I think what was incredible about this story is that the people involved managed to get all those people around the table and kind of, you know, they had support from Merseyside Police. They had um, the press on board from, from the, the, you know, from day one and stuff like that. And I think that really change things and I think it demonstrates what can happen when communities do come together I think that that's the ultimate power of the story I think do you think the um do you think everybody's as positive as they were at that moment or do you think there's stigmas returned or what do you think has, has happened since then yeah I, I still think that there is a huge amount of of stigma I mean and I, I think Merseyside Police's involvement was a, a, a huge positive at the time a part of me, well, I don't know this for sure as well, but a part of me had wondered as well whether because there was so much fear and stigma at the time, it was almost like an easy decision for Merseyside Police to kind of hand over this issue to public health and the kind of be at arm's length from it, do you know what I mean? Um, 
and I, I'd seen recently, I think in the in the last week or so, I think it, in New York, there's kind of been um, safe spaces for people to use illegal drugs and kind yes, of. Yes, this is a big, big plus, and you, yeah, we're so excited. I, I mean, yeah. I, especially I just saw that from your film, and, and then I was just like, oh my god, New York, this is so great. Yeah, yeah. so uh, things like things are progressing, but things are progressing incredibly slowly, and I imagine the people behind that, you know, have been working for years, if not decades, Joe, to to get that. Um, yeah. to happen but it made me reflect I think a few years ago I think Liverpool had something similar that doesn't exist anymore now I imagine I couldn't find out why it doesn't exist and I imagine a lot of that is due to um, government cuts and austerity that we suffered in response to uh, the financial crash of, of like 2008 but it kind of does feel like you know the progression that we've seen around harm reduction isn't kind of like linear it's a bit kind of like we'll take yeah. a step forward and maybe we'll take a step to the right and yeah. move two steps backwards and stuff like that, do you know what I mean? So um, I, I still think that stigma exists, I think. Um, yeah, and it kind of works cyclically as well, do you know what I mean? I think I was also reading in the week that um, uh, the Justice Minister here in the UK is now um, not allowing uh, prisoners to access methadone when they want to come off uh, drugs and they're kind of moving to a um, rehab-based... Yeah. Um, yeah. Way and I, I kind of think you know you you read something like that and you think like the the cruelty is the purpose with something like that. Do you know what yeah, I mean? I mean so. I, and I I was looking at Jay's um, movie um, with these brave women having been to Taipei myself and and experienced a little bit. I actually got up in front of people just to talk about myself for a second. In Taipei, I got up and sang a song and announced that I was HIV and then I wondered what the hell am I doing at the Mocha there, right? But um, you know, so I know what the pressure is in, in Taipei. And you were filming that. And how, how was that experience for them? Were they really terrified or were you nervous? Or what, what was the process there? Well, all the material they recorded by themselves. The only thing that I did was kind of teach them how to make a movie. But the movie is about them. So they are the one who tell their own story with the use of cameras. I also give them some tape recorders. So we record kind of like an audio, like about their dreams. And I think the process was really like a safe and supportive for them because they decided what to record and they record between themselves. So I, I think it was, was really beautiful and they were so, so, so happy with the final video. And we edit also together because for them was important that their faces didn't appear. So we came to the conclusion that we can blur it with color. So I think it was a really uh, beautiful experience for them and they want to continue. We actually want to continue making these workshops and include also more women from Southeast Asia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Abdul Ali, uh, I think Louis was talking about being a child growing up in in um, in yeah, with his mother was work. Um, look, get, correct me, but um, didn't he have? Because I'm just thinking about women with children and children growing up through this epidemic. Um, yeah, Louis Louis made the connection between um, he and I's experience um, having um, been impacted by HIV as children. So my mother worked at an aid service organization in the 90s called We the People, which no longer exists yeah. um, in Philadelphia. And Louis was a child who worked a nonprofit. Louis started working at um, Delay, which is a Latin, an organization, an aid service organization that focuses on Latinx communities um, when he was about 15, 16. And then he talked a little bit about his family. So his uncle, um, his, his aunt, his father also come to, um, to AIDS related complications. Um, so he talked about the impact um, of loss and you know, of, of people in his family who were HIV positive and testing positive um, as a worker, right? Um, and in our experience um, that we share, which is working in HIV prevention and being paused and, and, and how we navigate those, you know, those institutions as both uh, folks who work in them and are um, receive services from them. Yeah, I mean, what I took away from part, of, you know, one, I, I took so much away from your film. Um, but I had a question for you because that was so personal. There were so many personal details and there were so many things on, on the sort of 
the micro level that needed to be addressed right there and then. And you're in there filming, which I thought was extraordinary as all of this is going on. Yeah. Um, and so the, the very specific demands, you resign, this is this has got to stop. But then on a more global level, your demands are, are, are very um, pertinent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, how, how did that work? How, how do you feel about what happened there? Maybe both of you could, could respond to, to what filming that was like. I mean, yeah, I would love to hear what Uriah's thoughts are, but I think, you know, again, this was very personal and close to me. I'm someone who worked at that organization that I targeted. Um, and I, um, as a POS person, doing the med strike was the first time I was out about being HIV positive, right? Yeah. Um, and making that announcement and doing it in solidarity with people who were victims of sexual assault and workplace violence, um, was a very intense moment in history for me. Um, and so, you know, making the film surfaced a lot of that, um, that, 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 that pain, right, that I experienced going through that. But it was all for the benefit of the community. And so I'm grateful for, for what I did and how it supported demands of others. Um, yeah, I would love to hear what Uriah thought about dealing with this kind of personal narrative of mine. <laughs> I, um, funny, like, Abdul, you said, how do I feel uh, dealing with it? I, we share such similar astrological signs that we go, like, go deep anyway. We're not in doing filmmaking. Um, but can you repeat, like, kind of your question a little bit, Margaret? Um, because well, I was just, I had just sort of basically talked about, um, you know, how, how personal, the story oh, at a yeah. point. but then also this is a global story and you know and again you're talking about a model and how that model might be reproduced elsewhere but yeah just, you know that it was such a personal story you guys are all telling personal stories which is so interesting yeah, it was just really important that you know i hoped i told abdul's story to the best of my ability um in these formats uh and learning so much throughout the process. Like I felt like each time I had interviewed someone, it either got more shocking or like more thought provoking of like the details, like going through the media of this film was like, we're like, oh, this is really hard to put in just seven minutes because each person who was involved in that, like, and that protest and that med strike with Abdul uh, had such like personal experience within these structures from, you know, it's just like, like uh, Abdul's the spider and then, then there's these like webs from them and then there's these webs from the infrastructures and um, the nonprofits and whatnot. And I have just been honored to tell this story and um, we wanna continue, you know, keep working you think on it. have a lasting impact there do you, how do you think you've changed you know how does it has it changed um or is there a lot of backsliding or you know where are you guys um has it changed for for the better or is there backsliding on the part of you know the not-for-profits where where do you think that, that that this has landed you think you're you're anywhere permanent or is it you know we, as we were saying with Danny, there's some cyclical things that happen, you know, it's, everything's not linear, it just doesn't get better overnight. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I'm unsure how to answer that question at the moment. Um, Elia, do you want to take that? Because I think you had a, a sort of a moment in the back of the car where you're like, yay, this happened. We got rid of it. <laughs> Which is dead, right? And then... <laughs> I think um, the end of the video, Uriah uses audio from the clip where Enos is talking about my med strike and being in solidarity with me. Yeah, yeah. And Uriah picks the part where we say, this is the beginning. And that's how I felt at the moment of the end of the med strike in the beginning, right? Like I didn't feel yeah. like that, you know, I, I talked about this maybe um, not during the premiere a few days ago, but maybe yesterday when I was on another um, what, a kind of Zoom about the enduring care. And I think, you know, part of 
part of liberal the liberalization of of movements is to say it has an end right and to cap it somewhere either at the end of the met strike right which at the end of an epidemic right it's in, in the, this this kind of romantic romanticizing um this this time when we'll get to the other other side of everything and i think the truth is that workplace violence continues within nonprofits the truth is that there are abusers at the top of the the organizational chain um, at these nonprofits and that that work um, at Mazzoni, for example, continued after the med strike where workers unionized, right? And um, so the work continues. Um, unfortunately, we live within a structure that perpetuates violence every day. And so that means that the work of organizing and activism doesn't end with just one action or a series of actions. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank, I mean, and thank you for your work. I mean, certainly I saw a lot in that, uh, in your film that I didn't know, I hadn't thought about just um, how much of a power structure there is and how many people support a power structure like that, you know? Um, yeah. yeah, that was, that was an eye opener, um, you know, so thank you for revealing that to, to us. Uh, I was gonna say, Jay and all of you, um, very collaborative projects, you know, how did you come to collaborate? Jay, how did you come to be so, I know she's collaborative because I've worked with her and she's she's lovely, but how did you come to collaborate on this project? Because it's quite a lot to ask people to, to do these, to reveal themselves up to the degree that they do. I think Are you just a was, collaborative soul? <laughs> yeah, I think it was really like um, organic because they support so much between them that the video was kind of that support in the image all the time. And I think, for example, the, the photo with the apple, that moment, it was about self-stigma because the stigma, it, HIV stigma affect enormously mental health. So we try to talk about self-stigma and they, the, the most youngest one is Victoria and Animami and Lude, they support her in that moment. So when the apples, it was kind of like trying to focus their attention in, in, in like the apple representing the stigma. And I think was was really like organic, the collaboration because they write, we, we have of course, like a moment of a script but the script also was collaborative. The when we go to the street was collaborative. So all the process was was in collective. So when uh, Visual Aids came with the idea of uh, enduring care, I think it was oh, it's, it's amazing because it is everything made by the collective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, just to to to, to put a, a focus back on enduring care, that we get care from people. We've had enduring care since '96 when we've had the medication. Before that, not so much, but you know, people tried, um, and we've gone through this. But that also is literally having to endure the care, right? <laughs> Which obviously, um, you know, with your movie about uh, an institution, not for profit institution, you're literally enduring through it, um, and and how that works. Um, yeah, I think. Everybody's personality came through so much in the way these films are, are different. Um, Danny, how, how did you think about making this film and how did you go about, you know, like the creative process? Because obviously you're all sort of heavy creatives yourselves, you know, and you, you put your art at the service of these, of, you know, telling these living stories. Yeah, I think for me, so, so I'm a filmmaker first and foremost, so I think I, I got in my head a little bit around the word artist as well and kind of to begin with felt like a lot of pressure of like oh I've got I've got to therefore make the film in a certain way or it's got to feel like it can fit in a museum space or, or and things like that so to begin with it was a real struggle and then I, I had a conversation with a friend of mine George who is a filmmaker he was the cinematographer on the, on the film eventually um, and I remember he just was like make it as simple as possible and I was like, OK, and so it kind of, you know, my film is quite traditional kind of uh, documentary filmmaking and storytelling. And I think that's what I wanted it to, to feel like almost like I was saying before about um, I wanted the audience to sort of be left with questions. I kind of almost wanted it to feel as if it was like a segment lifted from a longer interview or a longer, you know, a longer documentary piece. Um, 
and I, I kind of wanted it to feel quite conversational. So in the way I was saying earlier about how I discovered that story of it being quite relaxed and you just hearing about it, I almost wanted the audience to feel like they were kind of sat in that same study with Professor John Ashton and he just well, kind of... You, you did an incredible job of suggesting place, you know, of taking us to the place. I think that was, um, you know, that was amazing. You know, I, did, yeah. did you, were you really aware and focused on I'm going to show them Liverpool? Or? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I've got kind of um, Kyle and Blake at Visual Aid to thank for some of that because it, it I guess it's the first time I was making a, a film for a guaranteeing like a non Liverpool or a non UK audience, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. having them ask questions around Liverpool was really useful as well because it made me think a little bit more about some of the things I had to communicate and you know even to begin with just trying to get a little bit com confused in how I explain Liverpool as the city but Merseyside as the region what do <laughs> audiences understand of those things and and actually I think I just realized that you know if you kind of you know like it's it's what it's you know show don't tell so if you can show those images do you know what I mean and kind yeah, of some, uh, some of that, you're giving us full I hate to say it but you know here on stateside was well, going global but you have a very unique Liverpool accent, if you're not offended by me saying that. No, British no, accent. no. <laughs> yeah, not, it's not, great. Not it's great, you know, I love it. Well, I'm, 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 usually, I'm usually quite softly spoken, so that's quite nice to um, hear, actually, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I think, it's, I think it's important, you were saying before, that all the films are really personal, and I think that does come across in the programme, and that's one of the yeah. things I love about that the program is that no one else could have made those films um, and I think often when I go into a project and, and I'm making a film I often think about like if I'm not making this film who else could or would and I'm attracted to projects where I don't see you know those so answers. Chapters on the film I mean it's I don't suppose anybody else would have done the same job as you Danny I it really it's really I love it I loved to you know I got very excited yeah. I have to say that and I, I and I loved the way that that was modeled you know um, and that that model has now finally got to America and, you know, has been replicated in different ways. You know, it was a yeah. great, great model and the film's so lovely. So, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. so much hope. <laughs> when, when, I, when I was interviewing um, Professor John Ashton, he, he talked about how he hadn't written up the Maisie model for about 20 years after they kind of launched it. But I think they didn't really realise the impact of what it was they were doing at the time, do you know what I mean? So for me, it, it almost felt like it was the right time to, to make that film too, do you know what I mean? I think particularly yeah. being within like the COVID-19 pandemic, there, there seems yeah. to be from audiences anyway, a, a kind of uh, an increased awareness around public health and the importance of public health and kind of some of those figures now, you know, whether it's like Dr. Fauci in, in the US or people like Chris Whitty in the UK, they're household names and people know who these people are and yeah, kind of aware they of they people, are, right? people now. so different world. What about Philadelphia? Because that was like a big piece of that, um, that you suggest place so strongly, uh, you know, again, or more of the personal in making that. And were you aware of how much of your personalities you were injecting into it as artists? You kind of gave up some of your own artistic agency or Uriah, how do you feel about that? Uh, can you say that once more? Well, I'm saying, you know, there was so much, um, so much of you guys comes through in these documentaries, yeah. your personalities and the place that you're in. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that, you know, you're an artist yourself. How much of your own agency did you sort of suppress to make this thing, you know, tell other people's stories? And how much do you think <laughs> yourself is in there? Because I know you're in there. Yeah, yeah. like, um, so from like my background, I'm a very like automatic experimental like artist. So from printmaking to and other things, you know, and I haven't touched media like and not heavy media, of course, um, in a long, long time. Uh, so this is what my first time, like even wrapping my head around how to tell a story uh, from like beginning from beginning to you know some sort of ending but again we talked about how like there is no ending and that's what's left with and I think that's why I ended the video with this is just the beginning um and even though that's from an archived uh note of Abdul um 
yeah, I had to sit with, it was funny, like I read something today, a friend had sent me about my creative process and how I have to like sit and kind of like strangely spiral into stardust and then kind of like regroup and figure out what what it is how to wrap my head around so many important notes out of what people are saying like um because i can be very obsessive with like reviewing things and she obsessive about how to yeah is she a hard task mistress for details sorry no, I'm, I'm asking. Are you talking I'm to me? Um, yeah, no, they were, they were about the detail orientation. They're extremely brilliant, I think, in um, in supporting me as someone who isn't um, a filmmaker, right? And trying to figure out how do you tell this story that um, I lived through, but it's hard for me to articulate in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, and so I think I think we were both able to just vibe really, really well because we're from the same kind of um, neck of the woods in Philly and we have similar communication styles. And so we were, it was easy, I think for us. Yeah. This is, you know, this is what I see. And then for your right to be like, okay, well, this is what I'm thinking could work for the, this part. And it was deeply collaborative and you're right. Place is very important in Philly. And I think be, both being rooted in Philly um, helped us work together to kind of tell this story in a way that um, that people could um, get a sense of what happened. And I think the other piece that was useful is that Uriah didn't know about the Met strike, right? So here's someone coming into this cold and then I'm the person who was at the center of it, you know? So it was kind of useful to have someone who wasn't um, aware at the time that it happened and kind of like that unfolding for, for them was really useful in figuring out how to piece this together. Because I, I I went through archives for a really long time in the midst of like then going to interviews um, and traveling uh, to different folks that have been a part of this film and stuff. And it's so like, it, it's just so odd, like hearing like the dates of like me coming into the story so cold and like kind of like placing where I am at in 2017. Like I was just, I had think I just graduated high school and I mean, no, uh, college um I, I think I was caretaking at the time and things like that so on uh, how I would miss such like such important like events um based on where the the cyclical of like uh pain that I was going through in 2017 too so it, it was just like really interesting um because that, that's who when I was talking with Louie I was talking about medical racism and the things that uh, I was shared in 2017 and how these events are happening at the same time. Uh, it was just really eye-opening. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to, like, this is my first documentary. Like, this is my first, like, I feel like this is like my first narr like telling of a narrative from, well, it, uh, for it, someone. It was um, so important because they, um, yeah, Using it, so let me just come back to you, um, Abdul Ali. Um, in a situation where we were talking about brown and black bodies being used uh, as leverage by uh, an institution, a not for profit institution, you put your body um, into that battle, you use your body as the battleground, let's say. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. How did you feel? How how was that? Because that's incredibly scary to most of us. I think yeah, it was definitely a scary moment. Um, I I we saw it as an escalating tactic. We had kind of worked through other tactics of direct um, action. Um, you know, there were two staff walkouts, um, and ultimately the board of directors still backed this um, CEO. Um, so I felt like we needed. It, it felt extremely important and critical that leadership change um, um, changed at the organization. And this was a tool that I, I thought would be useful to use um, to ensure that some of those demands were met. Um, and on the fourth day- uh, yes, Your body's the tool. I'm, I'm seeing it as your body. So, you know, thank you because it was a very brave thing to do. Um, yeah, yeah. And we all thank you for that you know, all of us in the community, we know exactly what that means. So 
yeah, it, that's a big deal. So thank you very much. And, you know, opening up that, uh, yeah. I'm getting for Clemp now. <laughs> you know, that's, it's very deep, right? It's very yeah. deep what you did. And it's so great that you two made that documentary and let us see, um, have some insights into all of the, the things that were happening there, which is a lot, which is a lot, you know. Thank you, um, Matthew. Um, I don't know if it's time for us to take some questions. I, it probably is. Um, yes, I'm, to, I'm on here as well, Marguerite. Hi, Blake. There Hi. Um, um, I, and I just wish I could keep talking to you all and much for much longer because each one of you has so much to say. And I hope that I asked some questions to let you at least say something of what you wanted to say. So at this point, let's try and make sure that you get to say the most important thing that you had to say to us, right? through these questions. Um, yeah, so again, this is an opportunity for the audience to chime in with some questions if they wish. Um, I just wanna say really quick myself that it was really interesting hearing from all of you today and thinking about um, some of the comparisons from the program on Wednesday. It was a very different kind of conversation um, where we got to hear more, a little bit more specifics um, to each of your videos. Um, it was really interesting hearing um, Uriah and, and Abdul Ali about um, your collaboration as well. And it was it was making me wonder like how, because Uriah, you revealed like a little bit of like how you didn't actually know about the med strike um, despite being in Philly. And I just wondered like how, um, how, how, to, how far removed did you feel from Abdul Ali's story up until you both were introduced to each other this year? Like, do you have, mutual connections in Philly? What was your relationship to the Mazzoni Center, um, if at all? Yeah, uh, I heard of the Mazzoni Center um, and like in passing and as like a newly baby queer, I feel like I didn't, I, I didn't like have a community in Philly yet, right after college. Um, me and Blake to the same college, yeah. and this is kind of how I kind of got introduced to this whole thing with Abdul. And um, the more the more we chatted, we had other mutual connections. Like I have a friend, Tempest, and then Tempest knows Cassie Owens, who's Abdul's friend, and they met, you know, certain stuff like that. But um, kind of. Yeah, we definitely have some mutuals that were definitely revealed, but not like still our 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 experiences still are so separate because of what Abdul lives with and what you know and what I do not. And um, yeah, so it, it it's been it's been a real cool journey to like gravitate. Like I felt like I was there at, mm -hmm. at some point. That was, it reminds me of like memories and like someone can tell you something again and again and again and again and again where you think that you've, you've experienced it at that point. And then mm -hmm. we talk about like 9-11, right? And yeah. how um, if, yeah, I was just watching like the Mind docu-series or something and uh, how people's memories will, you know, play. And I felt like it was like at a point, like I'm reviewing so much of this media that like, I felt like I was there also in 2017, but was not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that was really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. That That's really interesting to hear like the, the journey through that. Yeah. Um, so there are two questions that I see from the audience. One is from Esther, um, which is just for Abdul Ali thinking about ACT UP's activism, which was so focused on getting drugs to be available for people um, and thinking about that in comparison to the work that you did. Um, and just, it's, Esther was saying that it shows the ways in which the AIDS pandemic has changed, but also in many ways, um, a lot of things have stayed the same. Um, and she's wondering like, what are your thoughts on early AIDS activism and how it relates to your med strike? Thank you for that question, Esther. I mean, I, you know, I think I talked about this maybe during the, the premiere about, or maybe yesterday uh, when I was in conversation with Jill Cassid, but I think I talked about 
the the connection or the import, importance of ACT UP's history in the formation of the Black and Brown Workers Co-op. I mean, we study tactics from ACT UP. You know, we're in deep collaboration with ACT UP Philadelphia. Um, we were in coalition with ACT UP Philly. That's something that maybe um, <laughs> wasn't as clear in the film, but there was a coalition of people involved in the actions that culminated not just in the resignation of Narit um, and of others at Mazzoni Center, but there was a larger campaign. If people see the black and brown stripes on the rainbow flag, that is all connected to this time um, because that was that that black and brown stripe was in, introduced in Philadelphia um, specifically because of the organizing work that the black and brown workers go out and others were doing around addressing neighborhood racism um, and Mazzoni Center is situated in the neighborhood. So this was a part of a larger uh, series of actions. Um, but in terms of, of your question, Esther, I think for me, the ends were the same, right? The, the end is to have people receive care and um, be seen as fully human, right? And, 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 and um, feel comfortable um, at, at going into institutions and, 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 and that purport to care about them. Um, and I, you know, I did it through med refusal, others did it through throwing um, cremains over the White House fence, right? These tactics, um, I think we're all about collective um, access, collective um, liberation in a lot of ways. Um, and though they might look different as tactics, right? And one, because people who are long term survivors and some people who um, remember the fight for, um, for medication um, were kind of stumped by the idea that I would refuse medication. But I was doing it in order that others wouldn't uh, experience the violence of sexual assault, of anti-Blackness and other forms of workplace violence um, at this institution. Um, and for that, I felt like it was important to make that sacrifice. Yeah, and again, I, I'm gonna say thank you. You know, it's all inspiring. And these movies are all, you know, really inspiring. Um, for me, I, I just really, uh, they're very hopeful. You know, and I loved the fact that they, you know, you ha you were talking about a pattern and in Liverpool, there was a pattern that something that could be followed. You created a model there in Philadelphia, which was something that could be, ha that could happen, you know. And I love the fact that Jay collaborates, you know, and that was like in all of these films, in all seven of the films, there were so many beautiful um, ideas that were coming across. And so, and as I say, I, just all so personal. And the, the, the thing that came across, of course, is that this isn't over. You know, this is far from over. And I think it was very interesting that you're saying that this is, you know, this is not a, a happy, there's no happy ending just because the film ends. You know, oh, it's okay now. It's, it's not okay. Um, we're far from okay. Um, and we still need to um, demand a cure. It's not enough to have another piece of medication. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on my own soapbox, but um, for everybody, um, who's been enduring care, it's time that they don't have to take another pill. I don't want a, less pills. I don't want fewer pills. I don't want a shot once a month. I want nothing. And until we get that, you know, um, and we get care for people who endured all this care, um, you know, none of us should shut up and sit down, in my opinion. Anybody want to follow me on that one? <laughs> I, I just did my speech. I'm supposed to be asking you guys questions. Um, where do you see yourself going, guys? T somebody jump in. Blake, did we have another question? Um, we had one more question, um, yeah. which, okay. which was just um, almost like drawing some connections between Abdul Ali's video and Danny's, thinking about how they're both um, takes on institutions and in Danny's years, people are coming together to make this thing happen, which seems unfathomable, um, given like white supremacy and anti-blackness here in the US, everywhere really. Um, and I, I guess like thinking about that in the context of Abdul Ali's video, which is a person, a collective standing up against the institution. Um, yeah. I. I, I, I think there's something to unpack there. Yeah. 
I'm still hoping, I, I'm just going to circle back and just ask to because do you guys see hope for us? And I, I'm saying us as a community, where do you see the hope like? I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful because of actions like that. Um, where do you see us going from here? What would your wish be having made these documentaries? It's a big one, huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I have an answer for that. I, th I, think, I think what I want to say, what's been interesting for me since um, the premiere of the films earlier this week is, and I was talking about this earlier, I, I thought I was making a, and I, th I, th I think it's true to some extent, but I thought I was making a positive film, a film that kind of like booked some of the uh, more traditional narratives around HIV AIDS. But I think, you know, reflecting on the film and the, and the story this week, I was kind of, I don't know, I mean, perhaps upset a little bit. Like, why was Liverpool the anomaly in that situation? Do you know what I mean? Why am I in a position where I have to tell this story? Whereas if it could have been, if you know, if Liverpool was able to achieve what it achieved, there was actually no excuse for, you know, every other city in the UK or, you know, every state in America. Like, because, you know, at, at that time in the early 80s, and I think Professor John Ashton kind of sets the scene really well, like, you know, Liverpool as a city had been abandoned by like the conservative Thatcher government at the time. Um, so it wasn't as if like the resources shouldn't have been available to allow for this thing to happen. But I think I think that's kind of where it, it came from as well. Do you know what I mean? I think there was this kind of fear if they don't get on top of it from the off, then actually what's going to come in the future is going to be, you know, really dreadful and awful for an awful lot of people. Um, so yeah, I like I, I've kind of reflected on the film a little bit differently, just to, to be thinking about yeah, why why couldn't this be replicated elsewhere? What was what was special about like the city or the people or you know the institutions that were kind of brought together to do this? And I did ask the professor a number of times about that in interview, trying to get to the bottom of what what was what was special or different about this. And I don't think he ever gave a, a, a like a, a definitive answer because I think almost when you do something. For the right reasons it's really hard to communicate that because and you know the professor had kind of almost a motto about like um forget your principles and do the right thing because it's the right thing to do um, no, I mean, go on sorry so, so sorry I was, I was just gonna say um you know what i think is it, it of itself it shows us that that is actually a place where something happened which we don't anticipate, you know, the AIDS community tends to think of the battle ahead as not being necessarily one that we can easily win. So that is such a hopeful thing, even if, you know, that's why I was interested in what happened from there on out. Um, what would you like to see happening in Philadelphia? Where, what's your best, what's your best vision for Philadelphia? And then I'll ask you, Jay, the same thing if we have time, which I think we might be able to squeeze in. Hey, Marguerite, that's a big question. I think like you know, systems need to be dismantled in order for people to receive the, the care and concern that they deserve. And that's a longer conversation. But um, I think that workers, you know, um, demanding um, and, and folks who are paused demanding that institutions do better by us um, is, is something that I continue to, to, to work with folks around in, in the city um, and, you know, now seeing COVID unfold and, um, you know, having a recent experience within um, a dental office where, you know, the dentist was shocked when I disclosed that I was paused and the reaction from that dentist shows that we have so much more work to do. Yeah, stigma, right? Stigma is with us forever. Absolutely. Feels like. um, every time I always say this, every time you disclose, it's the first time. There's, you know, there's never, it's never, you know, like you, you're out. It's always the first time. It's always difficult. Jay, what do you have to say about where we should be going? Well, I, I can speak about uh, Taiwan. I, I would like to, that these kind of workshops, these kind of affinity groups can be expanded to a bigger community because I think now all the burden of the guilt is on the people living with HIV, but people living with HIV need a community, a network of support. It's not only the relation with their doctor, and we see it during the project, the women need to talk with other women. And this is the first time that they participate in a group that there was other women 
with the same experience. So that space for people is really important. So I hope that there is more spaces for, for women more environmental places that think the whole person not only oh you you need to take the medicine that you are being responsible no that's not the like enduring care is not all only about the the pharmaceuticals and the medicine is the whole person so i think that the that individualistic approach to care need to change and come back to the community even now in COVID-19 seems really difficult but I hope that yeah yeah Uriah in in the documentary um it, it come, it's quite clear how you know people with HIV are, are not treated allowed to, to take care of their own body because they're irresponsible in some indefined way just because they caught this disease um right you know, what would you love to see happen with that? How, how I mean, if we listen to pause people, we then solve so many other problems within the disabled community and the sick community and how we are even have access to care in hospitals. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, it's reflective on how black and brown folks especially also being paused again uh you could we could solve so much if we listen to black disabled people that's a great uh that's a great comment you guys are all inspirational you know that it's been um absolutely a privilege to hear from you as artists and telling your stories and um you know as part of this community and I'm, I'm just loved that uh, I've got to meet you all at this level and you've been able to share your stories through visual aids and through the auspices of MOCA with the larger community and I really think that um, all of your stories will impact people all of them are, are going to uh, you know give people pause for thought give them something to think about and in, I, if it's inspiration horror um, sadness you're moving people so much with these stories and the, the, the skill I, and just to say as a filmmaker the skill level is off the hook really engaging really entertaining if that's not the right word I, I apologize but just you I did not want to stop watching any of these um, films and I highly recommend that anybody who hasn't seen them all should watch these films because they're great they're all just great what an accomplishment uh, to have to have put together these seven films like this, you guys, great. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just Thank feeling you, lots, of love, lots of love coming from this quarter. You know, it's like I love I love the idea that we're building community out here, and I love that the audience has joined us. Um, um, just wonderful. Thank you, audience, for for joining us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, and so we can we can sign off from um, everybody's different corners of the world now. Um, but the videos will continue on. They will show um, each one um, one at a time over the next six weeks on Mocha's website. Um, and then there will be you can always view them um, indefinitely on Visual Aid's website as well. So thank you, everyone. And you all have my email just to blow everything up and be, you know, really inappropriate. Please contact me anytime. I would love to continue the conversation. And I'm sure all of us at Visual Aids would be thrilled to keep, you know, keep hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.